Hello and welcome to The Content Show. I'm Simon Carney. I'm the uh, CEO of click to view and this is episode three, where um, unsurprisingly we're talking about communications in the time of COVID-19. Um, also looking at uh, webinars again, because uh, just over this week, the demand to create online conferences, online webinars, um, just shift communications online in any way possible in a time of social distancing um, is, uh, is, is, is jumped quite high, actually. Um, so I'm talking with our um, editorial content director, David Austin. Hi, David. Hi. Hi, Simon. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you enjoying um, your, your social isolation? Well, I'm not that isolated. I have my whole family here. The kids just got home from school. But uh, yeah, you know, I've been adapting to work from home pretty well. Um, we were already set up for it, but now just doing it every day is a bit of adjustment. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I like your uh, your home office there. Thank you. Um, so we, uh, we put out a blog this week because we we're looking at um, looking at some of the articles about mental health mm -hmm. and um, it, it's clearly a, a period of high anxiety for, for almost everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in, in looking at this, we looked at um, what some of the psychologists were saying about, you know, dealing with anxiety, dealing with, um, you know, a traumatic event. And one of the things about it is one of the particularly important things about it is to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And how does that then apply to a to sort of communication strategy? Mm -hmm. um, no one wants to make, um, you know, to, to, to sort of profit off this whole disaster, but some mm -hmm. people are in the fight of their lives and they, mm -hmm. they're going to need to communicate to survive. Right. Um, so we had, we, what we looked at is, uh, is, you know, how do you do that in the mm -hmm. time? So David, maybe you want to run through um, some of the aspects of the blog that we put out. Yes. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of, um, a lot of companies already have their communication strategy in place and, and they feel like they want to react and um, push out material that's relevant to COVID-19, which is good. But I think an important uh, point that we make in our blog is before you maybe uh, get there, you should look at your own internal communications because that's really um, looking after the welfare of your whole team and relieving anxiety, as you said. You know, in, in times like this, people, uh, a lack of information can really increase the amount of anxiety. So, you know, just as an example, ourselves, our company, every almost everyone's working remotely, and we've really ramped up our internal communications, having more regular uh, meetings with uh, Google Hangouts. Uh, we've, you know, our WhatsApp chat group is pretty active. And that's, I think that's really helpful. And, and I think companies need to be looking at their internal comms first, and then they can start thinking about their external comms. Yeah, this uh, this got me thinking because of what was going on in our WhatsApp groups, mm -hmm. um, and you know, there's, there was a little bit of anxiety coming through from the staff. Mm -hmm. um, and a friend of mine on the weekend, or, or late last week actually, just started doing video blogs for his friends and family. Mm -hmm. um, that inspired me, um, I'm, and I'm not a huge fan of the video blog as a personal expression. Um, but my wife and I did one um, for our friends and family as well, and uh, everyone mm -hmm. really appreciated sort of hearing from us and just mm -hmm. getting a description of what it's like in Singapore. I'm um, clearly not as bad as in uh, as in many other places around the world. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's important. Suppliers too, like uh, right. you know, talking to your suppliers is, is is very important, and customers, of course, sort of helping people share stories. I think th their stories, you know, their worries, what they're doing to overcome the crisis mm -hmm. uh, is, a, is, a, is a really good strategy at, at this time. Exactly. And uh, just today I was speaking with uh, a local business owner here in Singapore, Michael Lyons of Recovery Systems, and uh, he was been doing the same thing. Of course, you know, a lot of he was in a position he was ready to launch a new product um, right before the COVID-19 happened. So he's put that on hold. He's taking that extra time that he has and he's going and connecting with all his clients, vendors, partners that he hasn't spoken to in a while, using this as an opportunity to reach out to people as far away as Phoenix, Arizona, he was saying. Um, and then he's also been connecting with a lot of family and friends and people are adapting. You know, he said his sister, who usually has a weekly coffee chat with her friends, um, can't meet up with them. and she didn't know how to include her friends that don't have Skype. 
So Michael showed her how to use, how you can send a link and they don't even have to need it. They can just click in a link and, and uh, join. Um, and then uh, as far as his community, as his uh, external uh, outward facing communications, he's also um, a bike enthusiast, cyclist and a coach. So he recently just quickly posted an Instagram video uh, reminding cyclists to disinfect their handlebars and their bar tape and be very mindful about their water bottles and all the different ways that you might be um, spreading hand to mouth content uh, contact uh, so that's pretty much in line with uh, his uh, you know his specialty um, something that uh, it's a way for him to help and share his expertise as well excellent yeah i mean that reminds me of the the video with the at the sort of earlier like probably it was about a month ago now we did with the events industry here mm -hmm. yes exactly yeah really yeah the, the, um, share their stories mm -hmm. yeah so that video is also shared in this week's uh content confidential and uh yeah the events people really have a uh a harder time than a lot of us you know they, they it's not as easy for them to all just jump online yeah, but I mean, what they in allowing them to share their stories, we also um, found a lot of positivity in uh, in their stories and and how they're using this time and and the way they're approaching it. Um, you know, it's it's clearly not a great um, great situation for them to be in. Mm -hmm. um, but it was uh, you know it was good to see that uh, you know people are being very um, you know very upbeat in the face of something like this. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing we um the other thing we talked about in the, this time is um, in our newsletter content confidential is uh, just some of the other fantastic examples. So like a lot of musicians all around the world are um, performing shows live on Instagram. Mm -hmm. So I, I, mm -hmm. I, I haven't been looking at Instagram um, that much myself, but I imagine, you know, there's quite a, quite a, you know, quite a selection, Neil Young, Pink, uh, Charlie XCX. I don't know who that is. Um, Coldplay, um, and so forth. The hashtag to look for is together at home. Mm -hmm. um, chefs as well, also embracing online content. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, the Michelin starred chef Massimo Bottura um, in Italy, uh, which is they're living through some of the worst, the world's harshest lockdown laws, mm -hmm. um, is hosting and hosting nightly cooking tutorials on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and in fact, I've. I've been really just impressed with the way so many people have found a way to adapt to this crisis. Um, you know, whether it's musicians or chefs or or, or whatever individuals' uh, line of work, people are, are, you know, they're not taking this line down. They're they're looking at ways to to use what technology and access that we do have uh, to keep things going. Um, I know that on Instagram, there's another. Uh, platform called stageit.com that a lot of the uh, musicians are using and that one allows for um, you know a small payment so even though these are like living room shows with with artists you know they can in maintain a little bit of income you know people paying a few dollars to to watch the show oh that's awesome I'm gonna get into that mm -hmm. David one of the other things that we featured in the newsletter this this week was um, a brands examining their purpose uh, and you know, I guess it's inevitable that that um, a lot of us as individuals are going to examine our purpose. Um, so, and, and apparently, a lot of brands are as well. Um, and also, using using this time to sort of look at um, you know what their marketing does and uh, mm -hmm. and 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 focus on responsible marketing. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So we we talked about that in our newsletter a bit as well. Responsible marketing and. Um, you know, some of the things are quite obvious. Like you do, you want to appear empathetic um, during this time. But one of the things I think that was um, important to keep in mind is the way that you should be evaluating your imagery and your language right now. It, you know, perhaps a lot of companies may have may have brand posts, uh, sorry, posts or social posts that were created weeks or months ago that are in queue. You might want to take a look at what you have scheduled. Make sure you don't have any. Uh, images that could appear offensive now in this new context, like images of people in, in big crowds or touching their face. Um, and I've seen that um, everything takes on a different context now. Just watching television with my kids, they'll be noticing like, oh, they're too close together. And we're like, yeah, but that's not that's not in Singapore and it's not now. So, you, but you, but people are thinking differently when they consume 
content. Yeah, there. I mean, I, I've noticed it a lot. The, um, I mean, it, everything's happened so quickly for a start mm -hmm. that um, you know that some things that are being promoted out there that were probably only you know loaded up a few weeks ago, yeah. suddenly um, appearing tone deaf or or just completely dated as a result of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's a time to really be careful and go through and double check before you post. That's for sure. Excellent. Well, yeah. thanks, David. You're watching the uh, the content show brought to you by Click to View. Uh, next up, we're talking to Alan Soon from uh, Splice Media. Um, Alan did it, did an online event yesterday um, called Splice Low Reds, where he was testing out a few different platforms before it went ahead. And we're going to find out from Alan how it went, and um, and again talk about some of these platforms because a lot of people are asking about webinar platforms, uh, video conferencing platforms how they work, what, which is best, um, what's going to achieve their needs uh, at a time of social distancing like this. Thanks, David. Thanks. Right, back again. And our next segment um, is, uh, is coming up. You're watching the content show. Uh, I'm Simon Carney from Click to View. And we're joined uh, today um, by the co-founders of Splice Media, Alan Soon and Rishad Patel. Hi, Alan. Hi, Rishad. Hello, hello. Hey, hey. Um, so, Alan, welcome back. You were you were part of our pilot show, and um, on that show, we were talking about webinar platforms, which I've got to admit um, is uh, we're just getting a huge amount of inquiries here at Click to View about um, you know how do we go live? How do we you know how do we best leverage these platforms to communicate remotely with staff, with stakeholders, with customers? Um, and I. I um, we were talking before because you were organizing Splice Low Res, which happened yesterday, and I caught a bit of it. Um, looked amazing. So I was just wondering if you uh, you both could sort of perhaps talk to me a little bit about the planning process for that, what went into it, what sort of platforms you looked at, and um, and what happened with Splice Low Res and what, and what you were able to achieve. Well, I think Rashad and I are still kind of recovering from all of this. It felt like, uh, you know, we were just saying this this morning, it felt like a six hour flight that we were on uh, with, you know, just barely any time to go to the, go to the toilet, uh, let alone have, have our meals. Um, um, you know, it's it's still quite quite amazing just kind of thinking about how only two weeks ago, you know, Rashad and I and, and our friend Jakob in, in Poland, we were just discussing how we would, Pull something like this together you know for a moment there we were thinking of Fortnite first as a as a way to have a conversation that was you know that could break you know some of these boundaries that we have we thought about how we would use obs we thought about how we would how we would learn from twitch for example uh we were looking for for different ways to basically do you know what everyone else has figured out a long time ago which is just use very simple video conferencing software and just make the most of it um and that's what, what we did what were you um what were you trying to uh, to achieve and perhaps tell us a little bit about your community and um and uh just run through what happened yesterday yeah go for it rashad i think i think some of the you know as alan was saying we were trying to take some lessons from gamers you know while our community may well be made up of you know there may be some gamer overlap with the journalism community the freelance journalists mm. the media startup founders the media ecosystem at large which includes you know all the the money people the funders and the vcs and the grantors but also the what we like to call media adjacent people who aren't as adjacent as we like to think they're right in mm. the center of things mm. they they data and you know people the de developers the designers and the business folks so we we were wondering you know should we take lessons from gamers how do they how do they talk and play and watch mm. at the same time mm. you know there are multiple interactions going on on multiple screens we wondered if this was something in fact we needed at all um and then i think um you know, we did a dress rehearsal the day before, and I remember, you know, between Jakub in, uh, in Warsaw and Alan and I in Singapore, we realized that our job was different from what gamers did. Our job really is, I mean, Alan and I, in the, in the reason we set up Splice was to mm. actually tell these folks stories, you know, mm. 
and that involves listening to them and interacting and actually, you know, actually keeping the discussion and the community alive. So we dropped all of the all of the gear and mm -hmm. we we went for regular video conference conferencing software, which is Google Hangouts Meet, and it worked fine. Yeah, so I mean, I I, I was um, watching the, the 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 start of it, and it worked really well. Like you've got, I mean, I think you had um, when I was watching, there was about seventy people online. Yeah, yep. um, it was quite funny because most people left their videos on, and so I mean, if you're a voyeur, you could just sort of click through, and there's these people staring at the screen. Um, That's right. It was, it was quite quite funny. Of course, I didn't do that. Um, <laughs> of course not. Uh, but um, but it, it worked really well, and. and I, and one of the, I guess one of the really interesting things I find about this whole crisis is um, we see enterprise solutions for this type of thing mm. are not performing as well. They don't have the bandwidth. They don't have the CDNs. They, um, mm. I mean, they're, they're probably their security protocols are stopping them achieving what they need to achieve. And it seems as though the consumer level stuff like Google Hangouts um, is really then stepping up to the plate. And the, the the bandwidth you guys got, considering you people people dialing in from all around the world, one of your um, you know one of the first speakers was um, was coming in from Bangalore, um, and he was getting great you know great bandwidth, um, not not as good as Singapore, I don't think, but um, you know it was it was perfectly fine. Mm. Um, so I guess that's one one of the lessons that we're we're learning as we as we go through this um, you know this process of social isolation. Yeah, that's right. So we were we were very surprised at how well it all came together, despite you know some of the teething problems that we had initially. And and you know I guess some of the the problems that we had were more about what we thought we wanted to do and what would be the most obvious way to do that, right? And I think you know in the end we we went with with Google Hangouts simply because it's first of all it's something that everyone's familiar with. Everyone has clicked a Hangout link at some point. Um, the expectation of of how you would get in there is pretty obvious to, to a lot of people. Um, and we like the fact that it only required a, a URL, uh, mm -hmm. which you could fire up from your phone or from your from your laptop. Um, we didn't go with Zoom in the end because we didn't want to have people, you know, we didn't want to require that people downloaded an app uh, on their desktops or, or their phones. And so we were looking for the easiest uh, frictionless way to make this happen. Uh, and as it turned out, you know, sometimes the, the most obvious solution is the best solution. Yeah, I mean, some of the, um, we're just looking at some of the, the commercial webinar apps like uh, GoToWebinar and Webinar Jam and, and so forth, quite expensive. Um, they to are. Set, to set up. Um, yeah. And uh, then there was the, the one that you recommended to me, Alan, um, Hopin. Um, I believe yeah. You, you tried that? We tried it and we didn't quite like it just because, you know, it ticked a lot of boxes on, on paper, but when it came to, to the final execution of how we would bring all of this together, it just didn't, it didn't have the flexibility we were looking for. Uh, so there, there are multiple things to think about as you, as you try to piece a webinar together, right? I mean, it's, it's about getting the speakers, it's about getting the attendees, it's making sure that everyone has an easy way to get on board uh, on the day itself. Um, it's about making sure that you can mark certain people as, as speakers. And so you, then you get to elevate them into a little box, for example, uh, on the front end. So there were a lot of these types of little things that were, that were useful, but in the end, it just became more cumbersome. So for example, unless, so if you were speaking, Simon, uh, you know, on, um, you would you would be first of all required to sign up as an attendee and then one of us would then have to you know elevate you to to being a speaker which was problematic and as someone who's organized events before you know how hard it is to get people you know especially speakers to even send over a, a you know a bio photo or something uh so that was that was you know cumbersome uh for us um, but also, you know, the whole sign up process of logging in and all that, it just became a bit cumbersome. Um, so yeah, so in the end, you know, Hangouts was, was the easiest, most straightforward way of doing it. I think also what happened with Hopin is it, it wasn't as intuitive as we would have liked, not for mm -hmm. the end user and not for the organizer. And, you know, there were a lot of moving parts. So while it did have a backstage, as Alan was saying, for speakers, and a backstage area where you could set them up and then you could sort of push them out or you'd have, you know, the regular stage. 
it there were so many moving parts and so many features that you got lost trying to figure all of that out. Uh, you also had a dashboard. You had great analytics, you know, which is, um, you know, pointedly something that Google meets, uh, the Google Meet misses. There's no analytics and no insights, mm -hmm. no dashboard. But, you know, we were playing around with all of those. You miss out on the actual conversation. With, um, I guess, mm, that's uh, true. with the Hangouts, were you able to sort of have, do you have a record of everyone who signed up, who, who came on came on the call? Nope. Not oh, with, okay. not as part of anything that Google offers. Not yet. I imagine. I imagine that's a. Um, I mean, that's something that people are going to want to are going to want um, as companies are going to want in particular. Yeah. To get capturing those registrations, those leads. I want to. So we we actually did that in a in a back and well in a roundabout way, right? So we got people to to first of all sign up and register, and this was a Mailchimp process. Um, and only after that they you know only after they they registered themselves, they would get an email giving them the the Google Hangout Meet um, URL. So they would first of all have to to sign up, and that's how we got to know who was who was there um, and we've captured about 200 or so uh, registrations um, so that was that was the only way that that we knew how to capture data on on you know actual attendees the nice part of you know Mailchimp being your front door to let people in is that you have a registration process that so if you cobble together a bunch of tools um, and then then use those uh, to synchronize with each other then you can keep this going as a community uh, long after the event is over. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Like your, um, as always with with your products, the registration process was beautiful, um, and uh, and you know because you guys just make design nice websites and newsletters. Um, uh, but it's it's a bit like running a Telegram group or a WhatsApp group, right? You, the, the conversation happens there, but you, when you set it up, you just um, you can do the registration off your own page, um, and that way you, you control that that sort of first party data, I, I suppose. One thing I wanted to ask: formats. So once pe once uh, once people sort of go, all right, we're going to do a webinar, we're going to take our events online, and then it's like, oh, but how do we make sure we get the same engagement that we have at an event? which is like pretty much 100% because somebody turns up, they turn up. Um, and, and then how long does it run? Because the, the, the general consensus is that if you're doing some on, something online video, it should be lo no longer than 90 seconds or whatever in, in case of a pre-record or even shorter. Um, but you went for six hours, uh, which I thought was <laughs> ambitious. Um, how, like, how did that go? Did, I mean, did you get down to, was there, was there a few, few moments where there weren't many people watching? Uh, I, no, I, I thought it was pretty steady throughout. I think, um, you know, that number started to come down later at the end of the six hours just because we were both, you know, in, in Asia, it was dinner time. In Europe, it was lunchtime. And so the number started to come down a little bit. I think even in the end, we were probably at about, about 50, right, concurrence. Yep. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, which is still pretty good for a six hour thing. Yeah, um, that's great. You probably but the is never again. <laughs> you probably got more attention than, than actually the people in the room who would have been on their on their phones half the time if, the, if it was a real event. That's right. We, we've started running a little survey uh, that we sent out uh, earlier this morning. And so, you know, so we've got results trickling in. And one of the first questions we asked was, how long did you stick around? And the surprising thing is that most people stuck around for between three and six hours. Mm -hmm. um, wow. But a lot of the feedback that we, we asked for, you know, tell us what we did wrong. What mm -hmm. should we never do again? Yeah. There was some feedback that said, wow, that was long. You should keep it to four hours. But the surprising thing was it doesn't really matter how long it is, right? Because you, you, the whole point of, of an online um, conference or a festival uh, uh, is very much like the point of uh, in real life festival or conference. You go to watch a session or a speaker or a panel. So there's that uh, compo modular component. Or you go for that section, which, uh, you know, and we had an Asia section and a Europe section. But to say that it was too long is, is a fair point if you want to stick around for the whole thing. And That's I love true. that people did despite yeah. being uncomfortable with it, you know? <laughs> what, was the, um, 
uh, one final question. What was the engagement like from, um, you know, from the viewers, from the, from the participants as opposed to the speakers? Were there, were there people jumping in the questions? Did you get them up on camera, for instance, asking their questions? Was there any sort of discussion or debate, debate able to happen in this format? Yeah, I thought what was interesting was that no one jumped in with a video question, right? As far as I can recall, uh, it felt like everyone was civil enough to type it out in the in the chat box, which was very helpful. Uh, and there, you know, Rashad and I would would just call them out as as they came in um, and and pose those to the speakers. Uh, yeah, I guess that's probably the the expected kind of uh, consideration with these types of events. Uh, yeah, I was surprised that no one jumped in with a, you know, with a camera question. But well, we're always very lucky with with our community. Maybe I'm just biased, but you know, people are so polite and so yeah. considerate. People were right. really good to each other. You know, hmm. people are sort of, you know, backing up pe other people's questions. People are people were actually engaging with each other in the chat box, and I kind of liked the asymmetry of that whole yeah. hangouts thing where you could chat. You could. It was. Fantastic. That's what you get when you get a bunch of journalists together. <laughs> exactly. Civility. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sometimes. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, look, um, thank you very much. I'll leave it there. Um, that was great, really informative. Um, I'm sure our viewers will um will uh, will benefit from that. I know I, I learned a few things as well. So um thanks very much for being with us. Thank thanks you. For having us, and you're watching the content show brought to you by Click to View. I'm Simon Carney. Up next. We look at our branded video content picks of the week. Hi, and welcome back. You're with the uh, the content show from Click to View, and now I'm talking to Artarak Metzianov, our scripted content director and Singapore's most famous Russian comedian, um, about his video branded video picks of the week. Uh, Arta, how are you going? Uh, I'm good. Thank you very much, Simon. As always, uh, thank you for shameless promotion. Really appreciate ah, it. Although are... probably it's quite useless now with the current shutdown, but uh, for the future, for the future, it will be useful. How's 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 your isolation going? Is is the cat enjoying your enjoying your jokes? Um, yes. If I had a cat, it would be laughing, but it's not. Uh, it's not around anymore. Uh, it was never actually. So it's fine. So tell me, tell me about the um, tell me about your uh, branded videos uh, this week. What have you got? So uh, we started. We featured a couple of things by Click to View and uh, Simon Carney himself uh, had two interesting conversations. Uh, one was with uh, Brent Dykes, who is the author of Effective Data Storytelling, and it was kind of a snippet of the conversation where basically. Uh, they were talking about the need of combining stories and data and how stories affecting the emotional part of the brain and data insights, the analytical part of the brain. And for the best result, of course, you need to combine both. Yeah, it was, this was fascinating. I actually did this interview ages and ages ago. It was in uh, Rise in Hong Kong last year. Oh. Um, but I only just go around to uploading it on YouTube. Um, but it was, it was really, really interesting. I think one of the, the key takeaways was that um, people's brains are allergic to data, and that's why <laughs> you have to um, you have to weave a story into any anything you, when you're talking about data and and statistics and so forth. You really have to focus on what's the story that you're telling with with those figures. Yeah, less numbers, more words and emotions, right? Or at least wrap them wrap them yeah. in an interesting package. Yeah, exactly. What's yeah. next? Uh, and the next video, uh, we did a special report on how Singapore's events industry is coping with a shutdown. And that was very interesting and uh, very nice to see quite optimistic views of the representatives from the clearly struggling industry. And um, let's hope that uh, they will get uh, after this crisis stronger than before. And nice to hear that uh, most of them are actually using this slower period to reinvest in their employees and kind of push all the trainings from second half of the year to the current month so they can kind of accelerate and uh, make their force more ready for the future challenges. Yeah, this kind of goes to the point that we were talking to David about earlier um, in terms of um, at a time like this, um, it's uh, it's actually very psychologically important to um, share stories and, and, and 
and allow other people to share stories. So that's why we, we did this one. You know, the events industry has been important to us. Um, they're suffering now and we wanted to, to help them share their stories. Um, yep. Probably enough about us. What, um, what, are, what are some of the, the other interesting, uh, interesting branded videos you've seen this week? Um, we, we have a couple more uh, pics. Uh, one of them was uh, the message, the St. Saint, Saint Patrick's message from Guinness. Clearly, they recognize that this year's celebrations will be very different. So they kind of added this spin that no matter where you celebrate and how you celebrate, it's also important to cheer up and support all the people around you, uh, not forget to be human. Um, so that was kind of like an emo emotional spin of this uh, message this year. Um, then there was a very, very nice case study by 3M uh, about firefighters and how their new technology allows them basically see through smoke which clearly saves a lot of seconds uh, uh, during the uh, during the fire and uh, can be basically a matter of life and death. And it was beautifully, beautifully shot and uh, kind of very emotional thing where you see in the end where the guy that they saved, the survivor, comes and says thanks to them. And they say, it's nice to know that we saved this guy and um, see this sort of gratitude. Um, 3M obviously being very much in the front line of the um, the fight against COVID-19 as well. Um, in the, the, the face mask, um, the N95 face mask and surgical mask um, manufacturer in the States. Yeah, I, I'm sure they will be probably doing some customer testimonials and case studies about that as well, because that's quite I, a time thing. Yeah, yeah I suspect, I suspect um, they're a little busy at the moment. I'm sure they are, yeah. Um, another one was uh, Singapore musician and businessman, uh, John Chua. He was talking about his passion for music, what he values in innovation. And again, it was also innovation with a kind of human touch with purpose and how these sort of personal values coincide with the uh, Audi brands. Actually, there was very, very subtle uh, brand placement. He was not talking really about features, more about himself uh, and then just showing the car. Um, and finally, we featured the podcast uh, from um, Credo Nonfiction Agency and their interview with Dell Technologies. And again, it was basically about the importance of storytelling uh, in B2B marketing and comms. And um, the, the Dell representatives was again highlighting that if you put your customers at the heart of what you're doing, and if you're telling their success stories, that's kind of the best credential and that's the best uh, brand awareness tool that you can get. Yeah, I guess, I mean, that's the storytelling ethos, isn't it? You're sh sharing sharing other people's stories. Yeah. So that's that's the uh, that's the wrap for for this week. Uh interesting uh picks, so hopefully every week will give us something new and inspiring. Excellent. Thanks very much Arta and uh thanks everyone for watching this episode 3 of the content show.